Eh, yo me voy a Dubrovnik. I will go to Dubrovnik. Eh? <laughs> It's a nice place. So we have to continue with the, with the agenda for today. This is the second panel we have arranged for you. I am Jose Monserrat, the panel chair, and I would like to introduce this so interesting session about cybersecurity and security in general in 5G. We have as a moderator a Ben Salin. He is a project researcher and an expert in cybersecurity in Ericsson, Helsinki. And he made this panel so so good. I mean, he put in the in this room industry uh, experts in communications. He put also operator and regulators, which are so important in this case. And I hope you enjoy this beautiful panel. So thanks, Ben, for coming. Thanks. So there has been a lot of uh, to, uh, to, a lot of talk already about security at, at, at this conference also. Uh, but now we are going to look into the interesting details. And we are going to run this uh, panel uh, pretty much in the same way as, as, as the Beyond uh, 5G panel yesterday. So we will start with some presentations from the excellent panelists. and. Then we have discussion around some questions that, are, that are, I will show on the screen. And then in, in the end, it's, it's possible for, for the audience to, to ask questions. But le first, let's start with some, some introductions. So back in, in the 80s, when I started my studies, then the Finnish universities were connecting to the internet. And everything was in clear text. It was really great to get into the internet, but everything was in clear text. There was no TLS, no IPsec. Uh, the Nordic, Nordic mobile telephony system, an analog system that was existing at that point of time, it didn't either have any encryption. And in fact, at the end of the NMT life, the situation was such that you could get a pretty cheap device that you could buy and listen to the calls of your neighbors. It was quite popular in Scandinavia, actually. And still during the 90s, the, 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 the security scene was quite different. I started to go to IETF in the mid 90s, and there was still very strong kind of uh, restrictions on, on what you could do with, with security, what you could export. PGP, the email security uh, application, when it got commercialized, what the company had to do when it wanted to ship the new version to Europe was that they printed all of the source code on paper and then they sent the paper over to Europe. Because at that point of time, the US regulation didn't allow uh, actually exporting uh, strong encryption and strong security electronically. We are quite, we have taken quite a journey after that. It's, the, the world today is quite different. And uh, now I will present the Ericsson view to, to get a baseline for the discussion today. I will present an Ericsson view on, on, on what 5G security is about. And now I'm talking about phase one, which was already specified. So we have now work going on in, in, on, on phase two, and there, there will, of course, be ad additional features there. So communication security, that's not really an issue anymore. We know how to protect the radio interface. The protocols we have there, uh, we are basically reusing 4G. Uh, with some small enhancements, but we know how to do it. The same actually happens uh, in general on the communication security side. In the internet, we have TLS and IPsec. They are well-proven protocols. So communication security is not really a big issue. Actually, the attackers don't try even more to, to attack the communication protocols because they are so good. They are trying to find other attack vectors. Still, there is also some improvement uh, uh, in, in, the, in the core network uh, uh, on communication security. So uh, 3GPP has worked on, 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 on SBA security, so basically security, improving the security in the interconnect network. Then coming back to the attack vector, so if you cannot kind of, for example, attack the radio or so on, so, so the attackers are, of course, moving elsewhere. So they are actually targeting, targeting the functions 
in the infrastructure. And even there, now 3GPP tries to, to, to improve the situation. So we have this security assurance work going on. We will hear more about that soon. And, 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 and that uh, kind of tries to make a baseline uh, security requirements for, for the actual functions in the infrastructure. Uh, then uh, we have improvements in identity management. So with, with 5G, it, it will be possible in IoT use cases or industrial internet use cases to use credentials that you might, might have available already in your organization. So you don't only have to base the authentication on, on, on SIM as, as has been the traditional way in, in 3GPP. Then we are trying to make the, the, the network more resilient. Uh, network slicing that has been up as a topic quite much during this, this uh, uh, conference is, is one of the ways to do it. Uh, different flavors of radio uh, with, with different kind of latencies and different perp use, uses. They are another example on how to try to imp in improve the resilience and then the base station in 5G can be div divided into a central unit and, and a distributed unit, which also makes the possibility to distribute the security functions and, and, and impact on the resilience. And then finally, uh, privacy. So, so we have tried to improve the privacy and, and, and the especially like, for example, the, the IMC is now in, in 5G, it's possible to protect it. So all of the IMC catches that there has been quite much about in the news, if you deploy the, the 5G features, the IMC catches won't work anymore. So that's uh, the, the short introduction to, to, to where, where we are today. And, and, and now we are going to get into the really interesting part of this this uh, uh, session and, and talk about the future. So uh, we have excellent uh, panelists here and we will actually start with Bernard Barani from the con Commission. And he is going to, to talk about the 5G EU recommendations on security. Uh, and, and then after that, we will have Eric Gauthier from Orange and he is going to tell more about the security assurance efforts going on in 3GPP and, and GSMA. Then we had Emmanuel Dottaro from, from Tails, and he is going to look a bit into the future, what the challenges are uh, uh, regarding the security and also what the new and emerging technologies are going to be bring in as challenges for security. And then we have Linus Strubum who will uh, give some insight on, on expectations on, from, from other industries on, on, on what, what should happen in the future to, to fulfill the needs of the other industries in terms of security. So, Bernard, the stage is yours. So, thanks a lot, Bengt, for the kind introduction. I realize the challenge they have about something like minus 10 minutes to get you through the slides. Ah, sorry, goes the other side. First of all, I would like to apologize for my uh, head of division. He was the one who was supposed to give this talk, Peter Stuckman, but for personal reason, he could not uh, join this conference today. So bear with me, you will have to uh, satisfy yourself with my uh, presence. So <laughs> I try to give you a few uh, indications and kind of a guided tour of uh, what the Commission is doing in terms of uh, security for 5G, beyond the traditional research activities where we are financing industry to uh, develop technologies for security. Uh, we have uh, identified 5G as uh, an important subject for a number of uh, reasons. Because uh, if you look at the evolution of networks uh, over time, uh, we have this notion that uh, failures in one network can affect a neighboring network. So it means that uh, say errors or uh, let's say problems, incidents can propagate from one uh, network to the other. We have this notion that something that happens in one member states can affect another member states just because of disconnectivity. 
This is not something which is so specific to uh, 5G. I think it was already the case with previous generation of interconnected networks across the union. But what is really specific with uh, 5G, what is very special with 5G is that we see that if 5G lives up to the promise to interconnect all sorts of uh, critical uh, processes in energy, in automotive sectors, in healthcare, in factories, 5G really then becomes a kind of uh, critical infrastructure for the society itself. And uh, in that particular context, we should be able to have a response to uh, potential attacks or to potential fault uh, happening in this type of critical infrastructure because it has very important rippling effect. And this is where we see the, the nature of 5G a little bit different from the nature of the various uh, uh, previous generations of network that we have had. So on that basis, the Commission has taken the initiative to publish a recommendation on the 26th of Mars. This recommendation is dealing on cybersecurity of 5G network. It's a recommendation because this is something that uh, we can certainly not impose. Security uh, of uh, infrastructures is a national uh, competence, so we are not uh, competent at uh, the level of Brussels to take uh, hard decisions on what should be the security framework of Europe uh, in this, uh, in this uh, context. But we have a number of tools uh, to fa facilitate uh, discussion uh, uh, between uh, member states and to facilitate exchange of information and potentially setting up, uh, eventually setting up the common frameworks in Europe to have a kind of a minimum agreed set of uh, procedures that we can all use to secure uh, these infrastructures. So this uh, recommendation says basically a number of things and it says that uh, uh, there are a number of actions that we are asking member states to take at national level. So at national level, we are asking the member states to come back to us by the 30th of June to identify uh, critical risk in networks and uh, to uh, uh, submit to us uh, the, uh, uh, their national risk assessment procedure. So this is something that uh, we should receive uh, imminently from the member states to have their uh, own approach to uh, mitigation of risk in 5G network, what they consider risk and how they mitigate this type of risks. And on the basis of this, uh, let's say, information, we should be in a position to discuss with all member states uh, a number of uh, enhancements to the uh, procedures which are already in place with the member states. So that's the second uh, aspect at national level. So at union level, what we try to do is that uh, we would like to use these national risk assessments uh, with the support of the European uh, National Information Security Agency, which is an EU body uh, dedicated to security, uh, to make a new wide risk assessment, so having collected all the national risk assessments to put this in a kind of uh, blender to see what we can, uh, what we can use uh, collectively and how we can uh, potentially uh, define something which has uh, EU-wide uh, applicability. So with this type of approach, we expect, I suppose it's very ambitious, but we expect that by the end of the year, we would be in a position to define what we call a toolbox uh, to mitigate risks in, in, risks in uh, 5G uh, networks and uh, risk, of course, which are related to security or data privacy. So in the longer term, we intend to use this work to define uh, under what we call the Cybersecurity Act, which is a piece of uh, legislation that gives us the possibility or the, 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 the opportunity to do these sorts of things. We would like to promote a certification scheme, so that means that uh, we would develop, uh, uh, probably next year, a certification scheme uh, that should have to be adhered to uh, by various uh, uh, 5G uh, implementations in the uh, member states. So that's basically the plan we are working on. Just one very last slide to say that in terms of uh, security, there are a lot of things, as was said uh, by Bank in his introductory schemes, which have been developed in uh, 3GPP. So you can see a large number of blocks which have been taken into account, either at the level of the overall security architecture itself or at the level of independent uh, functionality, such as authentication, roaming, or identification of users. There are a lot of things which have been done, a lot of things which are continuing, but uh, we Probably in the future, uh, if we look at it also from the perspective of what are the applicable standards to be uh, implemented, we need potentially to look at it from a wider perspective because 
IoT being one of the future, uh, uh, let's say, promising uh, application of uh, 5G, with millions of uh, billions of connected devices which are potentially very cheap and very uh, unsecure, unsecure, may create uh, a lot of risk into network. And these type of uh, aspects are not necessarily looked at in through GPP, but maybe in other bodies such as uh, uh, ITF, for instance. The same for all the things which have to, which relate to virtualization of networks and. Uh, virtual machine implementations and virtu virtual network environments, which are not necessarily things addressed in SWGP, but elsewhere. So probably there will be a kind of uh, a need of a uh, lot of cooperation between diverse ecosystems to define what are the real uh, architectural basis for future security of 5G systems. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, so my name is Eric Gauthier. Uh, I work for Orange, but today I come with my GSMA hat, uh, where uh, I'm representing my company. Um, the GSMA has been running a security assurance scheme for SIM card vendors for over 20 years. So when the 3GPP um, started uh, looking at the security assurance for 3GPP product, network equipment products. Well, it seems like a logical place to go um, for doing, uh, to partner with uh, the GSMA for the security assurance of 3GPP products. So uh, the, the GSMA and the, the 3GPP uh, worked together and came up with a scheme um, that will be uh, that was started uh, about six years ago, and that is, support, that is called NISAS, and that will be, um, uh, is due to be launched in autumn this year. And this scheme was jointly uh, created both by vendors and operators, and it's really a win-win situation between the two. Um, on one side, the operators uh, will get equipment that uh, address the security issues that um, that they that they face, that the the evolving uh, threat landscape uh, they, they, they face. On the other side, the vendors community um, will have a uniform requirements from operators, which provides a clear path for them in terms of investment in security features. So, needs. The, the scope of NISAS, NISAS doesn't address all the issues uh, in the supply chain security. Um, so NISAS uh, addresses the design aspect of network equipment product, the development, uh, the maintenance, and the end of life of those products. It does not address the delivery of those products by the vendors or the integration of those products into the operators' network architecture, the deployment, the operations, or the decomm decommissioning of those products. So it has a very, uh, the scope is, 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 um, uh, is, is very clear. Let's see how NISAS work. So when a vendor has a network equipment product they want to get evaluated, let's say it's uh, an antenna, a mobile network antenna. Um, what they will do is that for, they will provide to an auditor uh, among a list of auditors that have been selected by the GSMA, they will provide all their processes for developing and for maintaining the life cycle of this uh, uh, antenna product. The auditor will study this, um, those processes uh, according as well to the requirements that have been defined by the GSMA between vendors and um, operators. And they will also perform an on-site audit in the vendor um, site and produce an audit report. The audit report will then be sent to the uh, a test lab 
which has been accredited by the GSMA, and they select, uh, uh, there is a number of test labs which have been accredited, and the test lab will then run a, a, a list of tests uh, which have been defined by the 3GPP and, and produce a product evaluation report. The test lab will also um, evaluate uh, from the evidence that are provided in the audit report if the product was correctly um, uh, developed according to the processes that the vendors have provided to the auditors. Then the pr product evaluation report is sent to the vendor and the vendor can then deliver the product with the report to the operator. So the operator, when they receive the report, they have also uh, an evaluation of, their, uh, of, of this product. Now, what's important to uh, understand is that the product processes for different network equipment may be different in the vendor space. So they may use for core network equipment and radio network equipment, diff different processes. So this is why the scheme is made this way. So what is the status? So um, NISAS has been, um, it, th there's been a pilot which has been uh, successfully completed. Um, and it's the expected launch date is in October this year. And at the moment, what we are doing is we are reaching to the external stakeholders. I think one of the key features of NISAS is the modularity. So NISAS at the moment is focused on 3GPP products. But the same approach, the same scheme could be used for non-3GPP products. That could be the routing infrastructure of an operator, or that could be the cloud infrastructure as well. And we could also have uh, the modularity also allows to address as well different verticals. You can have as well um, different level of requirements for different industries, whether it is automotive, industrial, um, uh, whether it is uh, energy sector. So each of the, those industries could also have different level of requirements for that. Hello, everybody. Uh, just to make things clear, this slide is a little bit provocative. It doesn't reflect my own opinion, just uh, this sentence. So, I, What I would like to start as a first message is that cybersecurity really depends on the point of view and the parameters you are looking at. If you, like me, uh, more than, a little bit more than 10 years ago, I worked on networks, protocols, performance evolution, and so on, I didn't care about security. And security for me was just the boring things that came afterward, blocking everything and painful uh, in the process. I had to change a little bit my point of view. And I will try to explain why I, I'm, I'm making this statement uh, as per the, the perimeter and the expected scope of, of 5G. So if you look, if you're going to a system architect which is working for a vertical, maybe industry, maybe uh, aircraft, maybe uh, automotive stuff, he will have a full view end-to-end -end of his system where, and some part of the system is made with communications, private communications, public communications, and so on. 5G should play a role in this. But for some people, which are maybe somehow, you can say, old-fashioned, uh, they will just say, well, I put a crypto device on both ends of the, of the, of the communication, and that's just a pipe, and, and, and that's it for the security. I guess that's what we expect to do with 5G it is much more broader than that. We want to address some, somehow the digital infrastructure, mixing IoT, it was just mentioned before, uh, cloud stuff, uh, so uh, dealing with softwareization, virtualization, and much larger scope of technologies and not just transmission or not just a pipe. So I guess that this statement is not our statement. But now you have to take into account your own statement on what is inside 
your infrastructure or communication infrastructure because your all 5G is a system by itself. So you you're also a vertical of someone. So you're a vertical of people which are delivering products, chipsets, software, and maybe you don't care about what is inside. Maybe those uh, building blocks are also black box for you. So my message here is that it all depends on the point of view in terms of scope. And if you want 5G to be the end-to-end -end digital infrastructure, you have to consider not only the perimeters, the historical perimeters of 4G and, and 3GPP. You have to enlarge, to enhance it with all the aspects that are inside uh, your, your system. Another remark, it's even in one sector, one uh, partic uh, particular vertical, you, you, have, uh, you are minded with your experience. If you worked for 30 years in uh, trans radio transmission, you're concerned about jamming, you're concerned about some of the eavesdroppings, but you don't care about the uh, malware code morphology or things like that. And, and the reverse, on the opposite side, people in the software uh, sector just don't care about physical uh, issues. So security is not additive. It means that the, if you take your own, the whole system, uh, the, the global security is the weakest part of your system, the weakest building block. So you have to consider all of that. So now, this in mind, I will try to, to jump into the, uh, what is the uh, topic of today in terms of 5G. 5G is at the crossroad of many evolution trends, technical trends, architectures, uh, new maybe business models, and you should take all of that into consideration. For instance, uh, it was mentioned IoT with the surface attack is much more different than, than before. Before, if you wanted to change something in the configuration in a router, in, in network equipment, you had to go through the BSS, the USS, the LMS, the EMS, and so on. It was uh, somehow under control. With APIs, with the evolution uh, of the openness of the, of the that we expect from, from, from 5G, and the involvement of the uh, vertical sectors is much more different. You have to consider, for the technical point of view, that you have PCs that you are not mastering, and it was mentioned, IoT was not part of the work uh, of the 3GPP in, in the past. Uh, so you have to consider what exists outside uh, in terms of uh, security guarantees and so on. And you also have to consider the target in terms of security, because each and every, uh, and every vertical sector may have different targets in terms of security. Security is per an objective, high grade, low grade, substantial. If I take the, the new class of certification uh, which have been uh, put on paper in the Cyber Act, so now you have to, to say if you're high grade, substantial, or low grade. Uh, this is a new reference. It's not the seven level that we had in the common criteria, for instance. Uh, so you have to, to, to define your, your, your target. Do you want to be resistant, robust against attacks coming from states, from a student in his room? It's not the same deal. So you have to, to specify that. And if you look at what is expected, for instance, in the uh, command and control in an aircraft, you need formal method, you need to demonstrate everything in detail because uh, that's how we, we, we are saving lives. If it's just for EMBB, that's fine, that's not the same deal. But if you come to mission critical stuff, mission critical applications, they are lives, and, and you, you are not doing whatever you want. There are much more of the, uh, of the vertical sectors have their own framework of certification that imply, that uh, um, enforce, sorry, uh, some constraints into what you are using or not. So in turn, if you provide a piece of these systems with 5G, you have to also to conform to those, uh, to those constraints. Then we have introduction of new technologies. There is a lot of uh, buzz around AI, explainable AI, how you can trust AI. Do you give the control of your system to something that you don't understand, that is not certified at all today because there is not, no framework at all defining well, what you should do? So with 5G, I may be beyond 5G or 6G, I don't know, but I don't care. <laughs> this is just the evolution of the digital infrastructure. You will have to, to introduce this, those technologies. And each time you introduce new technologies like this, you have to ask the question about the attack surface. What does it change in terms of risk? Is there a new threat intelligence that has to be done on, on, on those topics and, and so on, the whole chain of, of, of security? And security is, maybe there was in the previous keynote, uh, uh, the distinction between reliability and resilience. In security, you have protection, you do whatever you can in order to protect your chipset, your building block, your product, your system, your services. 
But it's not enough. If you look at, if you are subscribed to a cert, which gives you uh, announcement of vulnerabilities, you have new vulnerabilities discovered every day. If I take my phone, my cell phone here, I have new vulnerabilities that were, were not yesterday. And sometimes it's very basic vulnerabilities on Linux kernel. So not something which is uh, exotic. So this security is something which is live, which is evolving and you have to follow that. Most of people dealing with uh, systems as, as a whole doesn't have the time or the skills to follow that. So you have also to rely on people which are pure players in this area. I will come back on that. So AI, softwareization, virtualization, this is not something which is specific to 5G. The guys that uh, worked on the clouds before also addressed some of the issues about virtualization. Except that if you run a software in a virtual machine or container, this is something that can be standalone. By definition, networks are different because networks are there to communicate. So you need to, to have something which is drive, controlling the driver of the card or talking to, 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 to someone else. The old fashion of security was parametric defense. You put just barriers around your system and just wait. It means that if you drive your car, you have the, uh, the right to drive your car in your street, but only in your street. A little bit difficult for applications. Uh, and if you look at 5G, we want to be open. We want to be, to serve as, uh, to be controlled by third parties, by verticals, and so on. So it creates new attack surface again. Service-based. So just a few words on service-based. How do you use communication services. How do you know that the communication services that you will use, your systems you will use, will have this or that level of security? Today, there is absolutely no way to announce no standards, no template, no SL attributes describing the level of security that you are delivering. So what, are you, what you are actually uh, using at the end. It's the same for the cloud uh, services, by the way. But it means that if you are a vertical, which you have constraints on your uh, critical applications, if you go towards this direction, using services and so on, you, you, you need, it's mandatory to have an indication or an, a, even a proof of what is going on in terms of services. If it's just a black box, we are back to the previous statement, just a pipe, so you have to, uh, to ensure and to enforce security somewhere else. But it doesn't, it doesn't match uh, the objective. So, the previous approach, which is classical one in, in security, confidentiality, integrity, availability, is certainly not applicable as the same way as we did before. Because systems are changing in time and space, we will provision on demand or some it's some, some, some resources or some, some functions. It means also, that if you look at terms of certification, if you certify a product at, at time t, if you do an update, an upgrade, maybe a patch in order to, to deal with some uh, vulnerabilities that we are not known, you should reduce the recertification. So it's the entire scope of the, what we call the incremental certification, how to ensure systems and what is the system in live will uh, continue to be in the security condition uh, under your security policy. And when it comes to 5G, again, as it's touch, uh, critical assets of, uh, uh, of, the, of the countries, of the states. Some national security agency director said recently that it touched national security. So it doesn't, it's under the responsibility uh, both from the member states and from the uh, European Commission, because there are some enforcement that can be done also at the European uh, level, to decide what you can put inside uh, your infrastructure or not. Because it's, a, it's at risk, it raised a question behind that about the uh, strategic sovereignty. It's written black and white on the regulation, on the recommendation of the 26th of March. Uh, and and we, have, we have to ensure that even if you have those uh, certifications or not, uh, you have under control all the supply chain and what you put inside your, your critical infrastructure. That's for the maybe negative message, uh, and maybe some, you may have some fear, but you are, if, before saying that I support mission critical stuff, you have really to check uh, what are the conditions and the constraints covering those vert verticals. Or if not, you just stay with EMDB and that's fine. Now, in terms of security, I said that we, we have also to transform the security. The message is very simple. The systems are transforming themselves with virtualization, dynamics, orchestration, and so on. If you don't transform the security the same speed, the same tools, you don't, you don't have security anymore. So it means that we will have to deploy the security 
as security functions, as a network function or anything else. It may be, uh, it may be a firewall, it may be a crypto device, it may be a probe detecting the attacks. It has to be orchestrated the, uh, in a concomitant fashion with the network functions. If not, you are not staying in the, uh, uh, the condition of the security, your security policy. And we call it software-defined security. Some years ago, it was not that popular. Uh, but when we started the uh, phase one projects in 5G PPP, uh, we started to push that. And now you can find it if you Google this, uh, this keywords, you can find it so, so, some, in many places ar around the world. Another point is the way you deliver the security. As I said before, it's very difficult to master all the chain, threat intelligence, protection, detection, remediation, and so on uh, in the security. So, one way to scale up uh, the security, for instance, at the European level, for millions of enterprises, uh, is to deliver the security remotely. So that's the security as a service stuff. If you want to manage your keys, even some attack detection, uh, manage your identity, and so on, you may have a very skilled team uh, in your enterprise, or you rely on specialists, and it's an entire business by itself, uh, which delivers the security uh, as a service. It's, I, I touch a bit on, on that security SLA. It means that how do you know what is inside your product, your system, your services, how you, you, you expose the capability to the security, how you give the opportunity to a customer, to a vertical, to choose this level of security in order to establish its own needs in, in terms of system and end-to-end. -end. So this has to be standardized, and this, as today, no standard bodies that did that. Monitoring. If you're talking about SLA, you have to talk about monitoring. You have to assess your condition of security in real time, a continuous assessment of security. This is also something new because before we just did one evaluation and it was it. Nothing was changing after afterwards. Uh, just a detail or so about standards. A, in the European Commission, we discuss in the PPP also the conditions in order to have a, a common response to incident. If you have a big attack against several countries in Europe, and, and it's, it's right, one, one country cannot face the other, you have just to say that you are under attack. There is no standard, or very few standards in IETF that are describing the type of attacks and how you communicate about this information. Or you take your phone, maybe, to explain that with a voice call, but that's not more, uh, very efficient. So if, just to say that there are still a lot of gaps and, 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 and work to be done uh, in terms of standardization in order to make it consistent. Maybe last remark about the conditions that we have in Europe. We don't have the same laws, we don't have the same regulation. GDPR was, was mentioned today. Uh, in order to respect the privacy and the, maybe the intellectual property of some part of this. It means that the conditions that we want to enforce in Europe are not the same as the one wants to, to enforce in the US, in China, in India, or whatever the place uh, around the world. It means also that we need to have the, our own means to enforce that. And I think our own means is also what is inside the, the communication of the 26th of March, is to have somehow uh, a strategic sovereignty of what we can, we are able to deploy uh, or not in Europe. It doesn't mean that everything is done in Europe. It means that what we are deploying in Europe is, is under control, mastered, and that we know what we are doing, and we do it the way that we want to do uh, in, in, in every uh, region. Now, just to conclude, maybe on, on the consequences in terms of certification. If you look at what is today the state of the art in terms of standards, schemes, about certification, we, you are in the order of hundreds or even thousands of uh, schemes to respect. Because of the regions, the, the fragmentation in terms of, of regions, because of redoing the same job in different verticals. Uh, once you go to, to see a guy in a, I don't know, in the aircraft industry, he will redefine his own way of thinking about the cyber security. So he, because he is very strong in, for instance, in safety, so he believes that he, he knows about cyber security. And maybe he will just reinvent the wheel uh, of things that already exist in, in other schemes. Today we have, we discussed the GSMA proposal or uh, activities. We have many, 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 too much, too many uh, uh, bodies that are doing uh, certification. And by the way, just one remark besides that, this is a business, uh, a very good business uh, uh, to, to, to develop, because the question is, is it self-evaluation of what you're selling, like 
I mean the labels that you have CE on the toys coming uh, for, for, for Christmas? Uh, or is this something which is done by a third party with a very constrained uh, framework and scheme? And at the end of the day, uh, you will, it will end maybe in trials and in court because uh, you will have to, to, to say who has the responsibility of what, in case of failure, in case of attack, uh, etc. 5G is changing the parameters of the stakeholders compared to 4G and 3G and, and previous uh, type of systems. So you have to rediscuss uh, how to distribute the liabilities in case of problems and so on. And I was recently in a, in a conference with in, uh, people doing insurance of the cyber risk insurance. Most of the discussion all the day was how to not pay in case of problems, if the problem is coming from a terrorist attack or a state and so on, because the law and the regulation is not fully available also uh, at this stage. So we, we have multiple stakeholders and looking at the insurance is a very good uh, metric because uh, it gives the, an, an idea of the maturity uh, of people on, on those topics. I don't know yet if insurance will go for risk insurance or cyber risk insurance for 5G because it's uh, maybe too, too new, not mature enough, uh, but it's a very interesting uh, question. And I will stop that. Thank you. Yes, so thank you everybody for coming. I really appreciate that so many people here. It means that you think it is an important topic and um, I think actually we need to raise um, the awareness and focus a little bit more on, on, on security for, for 5G. Especially if it's uh, true what uh, Professor Petweis told us in the previous uh, keynote, that $99 is all you need. Uh, if that's true, then we really have a problem, I should say. I will maybe explain it a bit more why. So, my name is Linus Rybun, um, I'm maybe at ABB, uh, Corporate Research, and um, I will uh, start with giving you uh, an overview of what ABB is doing, and then you give you some expectations, what we have as, uh, as a vertical on, on the 5G. So, ABB is a world-leading uh, vertical when it comes to power and automation. Uh, you see some examples what we are working in. It's a power domain, uh, providing devices, systems, software for making the energy flowing uh, to uh, where it's needed. We are working with uh, the industrial revolution, um, robots, uh, industrial manufacturing, but also process automation, mining, uh, oil and gas, etc. Another example is the e-mobility that is also raising up where we see that uh, electrical power is used more and more for uh, transport. Um, so, going into uh, cybersecurity, here are some, some of the attacks that has um, been uh, uh, happening in, in our domains. We had the, the Stuxnet in 2010. It was really an eye-opener, uh, what you can do. Uh, it's really an advanced attack, but uh, it was possible. There are some more recent attacks in, in, in Ukraine 2015, like actually two attacks to the transmission and the distribution grids, leading to power outlets, uh, outage. Um, quite severe attack as well, also well, uh, well prepared, but not so, not so difficult to, 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 to perform actually. More recently, 2017 was a Trisys Triton targeting process industries and also WannaCry was uh, infecting uh, both IT and OT computers or systems. When we meet our customers, um, they are typically always concerned about uh, cybersecurity. So that's one of their, one of their um, the first questions. If you then next tell them or talk about 5G or wireless um, solutions, then they really think uh, cybersecurity is the top question. Um, they really um, um, uh, are, are very concerned when it comes to wireless uh, systems, as, uh, especially when it's also connected globally to, to an outside uh, network, as 5G would potentially be able to do. The risk of that is that our customers then um, need to be as safe as possible. They protect um, the data, they, they protect the use of that data, so 
Um, the data is only used for one speci uh, specific purpose, just for reading and storing and monitoring. That's not what we want to do. We want to use the data for controlling, for optimizing, and for tuning the processes, for controlling um, the robots, the, the, the machines, etc. That's, I think, it's a big, a big risk uh, if we don't uh, mitigate uh, the cybersecurity threats that are, are visible. You also, if, if you talk to uh, our customers, typically are more concerned about availability and integrity um, above confidentiality. Of course, there are also applications where data is encrypted uh, with very strong encryption schemes. But typically, it's the availability and in integrity that are the most important ones for us. And um, then going back again to availability, if yamming uh, is a very simple way to knock down the availability, um, yeah, the attacker will go for the, for the uh, weakest chain and that it will be uh, an easy target then. If you compare, or if I compare 5G with what's already existing in our plants, um, I see lot, lots of new uh, attack surfaces. For example, the, the massive antennas, which you, if you can control them, you can maybe uh, interfere with um, the systems. Uh, the control plane is a new way. Uh, I mean, in the plant today, it's only data that's sent in the, in the networks. In 5G, you have additional control plane, plane signaling. Uh, you can use that during an attack. We have the cloud edge computing, the slices, the core network, all the virtual network functions, etc. Lots of new areas where we need to protect ourselves. Uh, I think the basic um, problem or issue up behind this, and there are good, good reasons, is that we are going from the physical separation to make it more softwareized. So we need to take care of that to protect that now. Um, so how do we proceed then? Yeah, some of the expectations uh, that I see is that um, at, at least uh, there is a one, uh, one, one good thing with 5G is the global scale, um, that it's very fast. We, you will get lots of hours of proven in use. So when you see that there are 1,000 plants that's running uh, using 5G in a specific mode, then you get some level of trust. After 1 million hours, then you have a higher trust that we can use. Um, also, to operate as local as, and as private as possible will also be one way to mitigate this, I think, that we also need to take care of. Uh, but then we have in the different domains, so for example, in the process industry, we have one IEC standard that we and our customers now must uh, comply to. And that means that ABB, together with all the telecom vendors, also need to um, help our customers to, to fulfill this uh, standard. The standard is mainly about how the, the process, uh, how should the end customer uh, work when they are running their, their plant. Um, and the last point there, strength and depth trust. I don't have, I don't have any good uh, uh, answer on that. Maybe we could use uh, trial projects, maybe we can use academia to assess uh, the systems that we have and look for the weakest points and how we can uh, increase the cost uh, for, for an attack. Also, what is very important, as also like expectation, that um, there are lots of defense in depth. There are many layers of, of security uh, in, inside the systems. Um, and also that we are able to monitor uh, any ongoing attacks. And we as a vertical would then need an API to see that. We would need uh, an API to understand what's happening. I also expect that um, the network itself is able to analyze the, 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 the attacks and mitigate them and maybe do some, some actions. Yes, that's all. Thank you for the excellent presentations. <clears throat> so now I, I will show a list of questions. 
And uh, some of them were already in, in the description for the panel, and I think, uh, for example, the first one was quite well answered already by Bernard's presentation. But I added some other questions also, and let's start for them. So let's first start from, from uh, the, the security assurance. So <clears throat> there is the Cybersecurity Act, and, and the EU is working on, on, on the uh, certification framework, and at the same time, GSMA and 3GPP is working working on the on the NESA scheme. So the question to, to Bernard and Eric is: So how how do these tie together? So uh, could uh, the NESA scheme potentially be part of the EU EU certification framework? So who wants to start? Well, from, from my perspective, I, I think it's a bit difficult to answer that question at this stage because, uh, as I said, we are still in the process of uh, defining or heading towards a potential certification framework, which we do not know exactly what it's going to be. It will depend on how far we can go uh, in our discussion with the member states and how far they, uh, they will share their information and how far we can establish a common position across the, uh, across the member states. Uh, to give you an example, uh, when we started the first meeting with the member states in uh, April under the NIS Working Group, Network Information Security Directive Working Group, uh, several member states, most all of them support very much uh, our approach. Uh, several of them uh, tell us, if you have already nationally a risk assessment perspective which is in place, uh, it's possible to comply with your deadline end of this year. If you have nothing in place, which is the case in some member states, it's going to be much more difficult to comply with your deadline. So we have to see uh, how far we can go until the, uh, the end of the year. Now, what I had understood from the presentation from the uh, NESAS colleague, from GSMA colleague, is that the certification framework which is proposed here is a set of uh, uh, specification that goes from the operator's uh, layer to the uh, vendor's uh, layer. I think what we are heading to is just one layer above, something that goes from the national administrations of our go governmental layer towards the operator's, la towards the operator's la layer. So these two things should be complementarity from the perspective of what are the views of the national administrations at their level in terms of what has to be achieved to guarantee a minimum level of uh, security, which still has to be defined, and then how it is implemented uh, by agreements, uh, industrial agreements, which are reflected by the NESAS type of uh, machine, uh, machinery. So that could be a working methodology, but I think we are uh, we are we have not concluded on that yet. Thank you. Uh, I. I totally agree. I th Hello? Maybe try the other Hello? one. Yes, no, it works now. Um, I totally agree. Um, uh, I think uh, NIS, uh, just, uh, I'd like to clarify that NISAS is not a certification scheme. Uh, it is a security assurance scheme. So it can be integrated into a, a certification scheme. Um, and. At the moment, we are uh, all the NISAS documentation is publicly available on the, the GSMA website. And at the moment, we are reaching out to, um, uh, to, um, peop, uh, to regulators, uh, uh, to the EU Commission, and we are um, uh, open to comments and uh, we are really welcoming any additional suggestions for the scheme. So that's... Uh, our status at the moment. Yeah. Thanks. Then uh, a follow-up question that is not up here, but but like I want to tie this to presentations from from Emmanuel and, and Linus. So <coughs> Emmanuel was saying that there is a lot of certification uh, frameworks out there today, and there are specific certification frameworks for different industries. I was discussing uh, just last week with one. Um, security company that went into a hospital and they found uh, devices there that were uh, 15 years old, no updates, no hardware updates, no, no software updates, just because the certification costs so much. So the good question is like, if we go into this future world where, where 5G is also used in the industry, we will have 
uh, first uh, certify the, 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 the infrastructure and then also certify the industry specific uh, stuff. And that, that, that will be kind of quite much certification and quite much cost. So do you have any uh, views on the way forward here? What, what should be done to, tr uh, done, done to try to minimize the cost in the future on, on, on this? Or is there something new that we need to invent to, to get okay. security assurance more effective? Everybody can ask for course, answer to this, so. No, ju just, just w one thing which I want to note on this uh, question is that there is probably a difference between the certification and the implementation of the uh, certification. I mean, wh what I was interested in uh, with the uh, NESAS process is that actually, when you go through this route, you re-implement something which was existing in Europe before what we call the RTTE directive or what is called today the red, di the red directive. Let's say that a couple of uh, decades ago, we had a system in Europe where uh, when a vendor would put uh, an equipment on the market, he had to go through a conformance testing center, which was an accredited center, which would do the conformance testing and would certify independently this equipment is conformant to the standard so it can go to the market. This has been abolished, we call it red tape, by the Commission and by the Union uh, in the late 90s through the RTT directive where we give the possibility to the manufacturers, they put a terminal or a device or whatever on the market and they themselves certify that the device complies with the standards or with the regulation. So it's a self-certification process which does not put into the loop an accreditation center. Now it would be interesting if before, sec before security concerns we have to go back to a certain extent, we have to go back to some <laughs> conformance testing security type of centers which would be the first level of red tape. So the first question that we have to ask ourselves is do we need these conformance testing centers or can we do it through uh, let's say, um, self-declaration from, from the producers that uh, they put something which is uh, uh, in, conf in conformity. So that would be the first step. Of course, it doesn't solve the question of the life cycle because the li what you addressed is a life cycle type of, uh, type of question. When you, can, you cannot declare every year that the product which is on the market is, con is, in, con is in conformity. So that would not be addressed. But there are many things which have to be addressed in terms of cost uh, at the level of putting in place this uh, certification type of uh, uh, systems. Uh, which you are absolutely right, we will have to go through. Maybe just a, a very quick point on, on, on this. Um, re regarding NISAS, it's, it's uh, planned that the NISAS will have annual uh, review cycle. Um, so that, that will ensure that the, the baseline level which is um, provided by the scheme will slowly improve over time. And, um, and this is a, a baseline security level which is agreed between the vendors and the operators uh, and the different actors who are defining this, uh, this, uh, this scheme. So I think it, 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 it does address the, as you said, the, the life cycle is, is something which is important and we see this as, as uh, very important for, from an operator perspective. Yeah. So I would try to uh, first of all, maybe to give an, uh, some, some, some uh, uh, experience on the certification. If you want to certify your smart card, for instance, much more hardware stuff, it takes eight to, eight, uh, to nine months. It costs. So it's, uh, it costs both for the certification itself, but it costs also for the time to market. So clearly there are, depending to what is your target in terms of certification and level of security, you cannot do the job for the complex system as a, the same way. That's both from the technical and the methodology point of view. Then, as per the discussions that we had with ENISA and, and also uh, uh, that lead to the cyber, what we have in the cyber act today, we have three levels. We try to manage to have about the hundreds and thousands of frameworks that I mentioned before, in order to establish a meta framework, at least to point what we consider to be useful in this or that area, which is already a start with the existing certification. Then back to your question about uh, life cycle. Time is a new dimension. Uh, and we are now using and want to use systems which are dynamic. Not only dynamic 
uh, I mean, in terms of product, we tell them what they do and uh, by whom they are used and by the expectation of people that are using those systems. So it means that each time you do an update, it actually you an upgrade. Each time you use the same resources or services, but for different purposes, you may have somehow a, a way to express or to, to check to have an assessment of the security condition. I don't know if it's incremental certification because it's still I mean, on the research side, to be honest. Uh, uh, or is this something which is, uh, you limit that, you block, as you know, in your hospital, so it's maybe not the best way, <laughs> because you have a, uh, still the vulnerabilities 15 years after that. Uh, so we are, somehow there are some gaps to be, to be solved. And again, uh, we are talking about systems, but we are more and more using black boxes. It means that you're using services from this or that provider. You don't know what he's doing. So, and there is no way to express for him today what he's doing. So you may trust him, you may not trust him, according to some geographical aspect or economical aspect or whatever. But today the thing is giving information about the security level. And this is clearly a gap. Because most of the usage of the resources, of the services, and it's particularly true for 5G, will be based on that. So if you want trust, including for verticals that have their own constraint and certification, I guess we have to answer this, those type of questions. Uh, oops, one reflection I have is also that from um, from uh, the process domains in from ABB, uh, one discussion topic we have there is that if you are certifying the, um, the engineering process for for your software, then um, it's it's easier to manage these updates uh, and the maintenance of the products. Right, but then I, I still a short question on, on the certification before we move on to Eric. So, so the, you, you said that the current kind of uh, NISA's process is, is, is um, concentrating on, on, on the vendor processes. And, and um, so do you see that that, that um, in the future also would be looking even broader in the life cycle and maybe also looking at the operations so when you take the the the, the actual uh, products into use in in, in the operator then i may try to, i may try to answer as a system integrator okay <laughs> so uh, yeah. we are also vendors for part of it but also system but uh, most of the time we are system integrators so uh, Okay, first of all, if you want to reach some grade of security, you cannot rely on self-assessment. Uh, so and that's what is written for the, in the Cyber Act and for the low level, okay, but for uh, substantial and I grade, this is clearly not uh, the way we, we, we have to go. Uh, then the vendor itself, the product of the vendor or the service of the vendor are based on aggregation composition of pieces. It's, it's a, most of the time, it's a system itself. If you take a router, it's a mix of a lot of things inside the router. So. So we, we I, and I don't know yet, it's an open question because the, the, behind that you have the liabilities, so you, you also have to manage that. Uh, and I don't, I'm not sure that we, we do this type of uh, tools today. Just maybe one remark, because I am a company uh, dealing with dual markets, uh, civilian and military. In military area, we have some way to qualify solutions. But those solutions are less open, much less open than what we are. We will want to do with 5G. So, so this is not exactly the same problem. But if, even in this case, it's, it's already difficult. Did you want to say something, Eric? Yes. No. I think that's a that's a very good point. Um, the GSMA has started a work on the whole supply chain security, and this includes as well the operators. Um, we are at the uh, GSMA also looking at the um, baseline controls for mobile operators and I think the, this um, in the future will be uh, will be extended and will be uh, so we, we are starting the work uh, I think the work on network vendors is more advanced at the moment so this is ready to be launched um, the work on the operators is starting sorry just to add because in when you say network vendors, I don't know what is included or not. Uh, for instance, by law in France today, you, you're obliged to deploy some probes in order to detect attacks and to, to report on the cyber attacks. So it's part of the system, it's part of the network. You have to be certified in order to deliver those probes because it's clearly security devices inside uh, the network. So I don't know if it's part of the network or not. <laughs> but but a, 
if you want to have an approach in GSMA with vendors and, and operators, you have to, I guess, to include all the providers and all pieces of the, of the system. All right, good. This really interesting discussion, and there are challenges here, as we can see from the discussion. But let's now move on. I, I, I would like to now go, go to this balance question. So this is also interesting because in the presentations we saw that kind of 5G is different from the earlier mobile generations because we get a lot of new, new uh, uh, technology that is being used. So we have virtualization, we have SDN and, and, and all of these things. So it's a bit different. So the one question is, so where is the balance and where should the security actually be put? So how much of the security should be in the infrastructure and how much should you do on the application level? Uh, and there are kind of interesting examples, like if you look at the internet today, what is happening, so most of the applications are, are actually starting to, to use end-to-end -end security like WhatsApp uh, for, for web services, we, we are having TLS almost, it's, it's a very high percentage of the web traffic that is, is, is protected today. But then we still have, for example, in the internet, we have DNS, which is pretty hard to protect. So there are still uh, issues related to DNS. So what do you see about this? Where, where should the, the security be put in the future? what should be on the application level and what should be in the infrastructure? I think it should be put everywhere. I mean, you need to, you need to have a safe, uh, secure infrastructure. You need to have a good interface. You need to have uh, strong uh, protection also for applications. And every layer needs to take care about their vulnerab vulnerabilities and protect themselves. Um, not as... Uh, as, as, as as reasonable as possible, and um, it's always a balance between cost and risk. But I think every layer needs to take care of uh, themselves, and we will often also in uh, in the vertical see and to end um, security layers on top. But we also expect that that there are uh, security added in the, in the infrastructure. Uh, yes. Maybe. Just to, to see one well, well, if you look at the system level, system architecture, the application, you can solve the problem of confidentiality and part of integrity. If you are doing remote surgery, this is not the problem. The problem is the availability. So, and, and in most of the industrial cases, availability is first before confidentiality. Even if data centric is very important. I'm not saying that we, you have to, to not care about, uh, about confidentiality, but, but availability, and it's much more difficult to commit on that. If you look at the critical uh, verticals and the markets of, uh, of those people, uh, they are asking for commitment on the availability for sure. Um, I, I join also the, uh, the views that uh, you need a security in both uh, in the infrastructure and in the application level. Um, I think historically uh, th th there's been uh, a lot of focus on the application and, and vendors have been issuing products, whether it is from a, an IoT perspective or a network perspective, um, running on open uh, operating system. And there is an assumption that because it's open source, then it's, um, uh, it's, it's secure. And actually the reality is that it's not necessarily true. Um, and so it, I think it's, it's, it's important to, uh, that both, uh, that you don't assume that because you, you, you take a, a stack which is existing, that this stack is, uh, is secure because uh, uh, it is open source. Yeah. Merci, thank you. So what I believe, I'm not sure to be an expert in 3GPP matters, but what I believe is that to answer this question, I, I first of all, I fully concur with the colleagues on the, having the, the two aspects of secure. But maybe there is also an element of what application you are considering. And this is the difficulty of uh, 5G. If you want to define the security elements, you need to define a threat landscape. To define a threat landscape, most probably depend on the type of the type of applications that you are, uh, that you are uh, talking about. Some uh, uh, very cheap uh, terminals and devices like uh, IoT devices 
They are to an extent part of the infrastructure, but may be very difficult to secure because they are cheap and they don't want to go uh, beyond a certain, a certain price point. So you will have to look into how far the, infra the rest of the infrastructure can cater for the potential compromission of this type of, uh, this type of devices. For instance, we have seen in the past that you can generate with botnets uh, synchronized attacks from uh, millions of IoT devices that try to access the network at a certain, exactly at the same moment. So you crash the run access, uh, uh, but this is something which is taken care of, potentially taken care of by 3GPP existing, uh, existing standards. So there are potential tools to, uh, to, deal, to deal with this. Here, really, it's an attack to the infrastructure. So the, the infrastructure is the prime, uh, is the prime point to be, uh, to be secure. On the other hand, what IoT uh, applications gives you is the possibility to, to access data in applications. And here at the level of data access, uh, certainly this is an application level to uh, make sure that the data are secure and the access to the data cannot be compromised by some uh, rogue uh, type of uh, behavior. So that there is a real diversity of uh, uh, cases in my view that maybe needs to look into it from a case by case perspective, which is extremely difficult in 5G because 5G was not designed for one single application, it's defined for whatever kind of unpredictable application. So you have to predict for the un unpredictable, I think, in this case. All right, thanks. So one final question be, be, before we get the audience to ask some questions. So, I mean, when we are talking about the securities, we, we always talk a lot about threats and we, we tend to be quite negative. So now let's try to try to turn this a bit positive. So we, we, we have been talking about this all new, new technologies coming. So do you see that these new technologies could help in enhancing the security in the future? Well, I can answer maybe for on two the two uh, those technologies. If you look at the virtualization, you can orchestrate in much more flexible and smart manner the your security functions. So you have more vulnerabilities on one side, but you can uh, mitigate also with the new capabilities in terms of better deployment of the, uh, uh, and smart deployment of the functions. And it's exactly the same with AI. So we were talking about AI. AI is a, it comes with some risk, uh, but also some new capability to add it. The competition is ongoing <laughs> between the attackers and, and the defenders. So, so and it, will, it won't start tomorrow. Each and every uh, new technology in general comes like this. You have, uh, because the attackers can also use the new technologies, so you have to compete and, uh, and to be the best. So it's the same balance all the time. <laughs> Eric. Yes, um, I, I, I agree also that so that you, you, you can see that um, because it's, it's existing technology that will be uh, existing standards that will, be, that will be reused and we are moving at least from uh, our core network to, to a more um, IT type of, of uh, environment, uh, we will be uh, benefiting from all the existing um, security work that has been done on, uh, on in the IT space for, um, um, but I think 5G is also introducing some um, new security functions and which will make, for example, consumers a lot more uh, anonymous on on the network. Uh, so there is a um, anonymity. There, there, there is also. Um, uh, when consumers will be roaming abroad, we, uh, the home network will also m know in which network the consumer is and with a much more in uh, greater level of insurance. So it's, uh, it there is a number of, of security benefits also that 5G will be bringing. Yeah. Any more comments? If not, then we can take uh, questions from the audience. We still have a couple of minutes, so a couple of questions from the audience. Yeah, hello, thanks. Very interesting discussion. I'm uh, Matsur Hani from Ofcom, the UK regulator. So part of the work we do in the technology um, side of Ofcom is uh, the security assessment framework for the operators. And I'm very interested in, in the verticals aspect of what you said about the expectation to have local and shared networks. And uh, we're about to um, make a decision on allowing 400 megahertz of shared spectrum 
available for those type of networks. So there's clearly a commercial demand. But in terms of the security frameworks that we've been talking about for operators, that could potentially mean hundreds or thousands of uh, private networks being set up uh, in the UK alone. So currently they're not in the legal framework for any type of uh, security assurance scheme. Um, should they be brought, should, should private networks then be brought into this framework? Uh, should we regulate for those? Or, or how are we going to manage the security of 5G networks being rolled out for, for local and uh, private networks? Yes, perhaps I can take this question. Um, uh, in terms of the NISA scheme, to, today uh, the scheme is based on uh, security testing that are, have been defined at the 3G, 3GPP level, they are called SCAS. And those different SCAS uh, are today specific to a network equipment, and at the moment they provide a baseline level. But nothing prevents those SCAS to be, as I said before, to be extended to non-3GPP product, and also nothing prevents them to be um, to have some additional requirements for different verticals. So if you have a specific um, requirements in terms of security uh, for antenna products, let's say, or for uh, or network core products, then those security requirements can be added into a new SCAS that would then build upon the baseline security uh, layer that has been, uh, that is already defined. So you can have new requirements. And this is really the, uh, I think the beauty of NISAS is, is its modular aspect and, and it's, it's very flexible for, for this. So um, yes, we, we, we would welcome the, then to have uh, the input as well from Ofcom and other parties to uh, on, on, on the NISA scheme and um, uh, yes, that would be a very good input. Yeah. Just a bit, boy, what is this not certificate per se, but uh, when you want to be a, a telco in, in most of the countries in Europe and even in the world, you need to demonstrate that you're capable to, to do lawful interception. And, and a, when it comes to private networks, I don't know if it's only local or if it's a slice end to end or whatever, the, which flavor of slice. Uh, but I, I mentioned the liabilities issues. This is clearly, for instance, blur for me because we, we don't know why, who will be really responsible of what. Uh, and, and again, uh, I guess on the uh, historical incumbent uh, side, uh, if they want to share the infrastructure with some uh, power given to the customer, to the tenant, for some slices, they will not continue to, to assume all the responsibilities, I guess. <laughs> so it, it has to be a fair distribution about responsibilities. But at the end of the day, you cannot have no regulation or no enforcement of some security function, even if it's private. So no easy answer, but maybe it gives some help in, in, in trying to figure out. Are there other questions from the audience? Since people are starting to get hungry soon, it's lunch soon, so we, I, I think we can, can end the session. I, I really want to thank the panel for the excellent presentations and the excellent discussion, so let's give a clap of hands. And feel free to, if, if you still have some questions, feel free to, to come and discuss with us after the session. The session is ended, thank you.